Welcome back. Um, to ease us into the second part of today, we've just watched a video which should hopefully stimulate this following discussion. Uh, we, in this final discussion, we'll be focusing on gender equality plans and what it means to make them a reality. This is an important topic to consider as we look at shaping the new era and the requirements of the Revitalized Framework Programme. In this session, I'm joined by an esteemed panel, but uh, first of all, to set the scene, we specifically will be looking at stakeholder organizations' current actions or those that are under, under discussion to promote gender equality in the new era, the opportunities and challenges of the new gender equality plan requirements in Horizon Europe from the institutional perspective, and emerging topics and needs from the perspective of era stakeholders. And finally, what can be done to overcome the continued differences across institutions in the uptake of gender equality measures and policies? To bring us the perspective of the era stakeholders that we've been referring to, which are fundamental to the delivery of research, I welcome our esteemed panel. We have Mark Schiltz, the president of Science Europe with us. Thank you for joining us. We have Rick van der Waal, the president of CESAR, the Conference of European Schools for Advanced Engineering, Education and Research. We have Paul Boyle, uh, the vice president of the EUA, the European Universities Association. And we have Oana van der Tocht, the a senior business developer in space and scientific instrumentation from NTP, who's a member of ERTO, the European Association of Research and Technology Organization. We uh, will hopefully be joined shortly by Jadranka Gvozdanovic, the chair of the Gender and Diversity Working Group uh, at LIRU, the League of European Research Universities. Uh, and when she is able to join us, we'll warmly welcome her. But for now, I suggest we kick off with the panel that we have in front of us. Welcome. To get to the discussion, to get the discussion going, I'd like to invite you uh, to talk a bit about your stakeholder organization's current gender equality priorities um, for the new era. Mark Schultz, could you could you get the ball rolling, please? I'm afraid you're on mute. There's always going to be one. <laughs> so, yes, of course. Thank, Thank you, you Cliff. <laughs> Even after 18 months. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for, for providing this opportunity to, to, uh, to talk about and discuss about the topic, which, uh, which is of, uh, of, of great importance for Science Europe. So Science Europe is the, uh, the association of major national uh, research funding and research performing organization in, uh, in Europe and, and gender uh, equality has been uh, right since the beginning of Science Europe, one of our most important priorities. And we published uh, uh, back in January 2017, we actually published a practical guide with recommendations uh, for research, for, for research organizations and particular funders and major performers to uh, uh, on, on what actions uh, can be done to, uh, to improve uh, gender, uh, gender equality in research. Um, and, and in that one of, of course one of our major in, in, in our stakeholder in our organizations one of our one of the major uh, activities that we do is evaluating uh, evaluating researchers evaluating research proposals that's what we do as founders and there is a key uh, a key aspect here is uh, is to, to, to assess whether there are biases and how we can deal with these uh, with these biases and that's one of our major recommendation at that time was that we should uh, all start collecting uh, uh, gender disaggregated data, uh, so that we get a base, and that we get the, that we get what is required to monitor, and also to see which kind of interventions, when when we when we issue recommendations, when we implement recommendations, to see uh, through the data actually what the impact and what the effect uh, of these uh, recommendations are. We also, uh, I should say this beyond Science Europe, we're also very active uh, in, in, in the Global Research Council, which is, in, which is the organization of funders across the world, uh, and where we are co-chairing a gender working group, um, which, which deals with precisely with these issues, with this aggregation of, 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 of data collection uh, and integrating the gender dimension in research, uh, including also aspects like harassment and, and, and bullying. Uh, and a, re a very recent report, which was published just in May this year of the, of the uh, Global Research Council Gender Working Group, found that over 80% of the funders uh, uh, collected, collect, currently collect gender disaggregated data. 
uh, and, and mostly these data are collected concerned funding applications and, and PI, PI gender. Uh, so we're also, uh, I, I think when it coming back to this issue about bias, um, we take very specific actions in our organizations to, to counter this. There are, there are actions like, for instance, having, having a bias uh, unconsciousness bias observers sitting in, in panel meetings when, when applications are discussed, just to make sure that things, uh, uh, that, that, that things run, uh, run the correct way. Um, so we fully support, uh, coming back to the, uh, to the gender equality plans, we fully support that a number of, uh, of our members have, uh, have implemented uh, gender uh, equality plans for many years or made it a requirement for funding applications that institutions have a gender equality plan. Uh, so I think in, in, in some sense, we have been, uh, uh, we have been uh, spearheading these, these efforts and we're very happy that this, this, this is now becoming a, a, general, uh, a general approach. And I leave it here so that we can have a discussion and I'll, I'll have a few words to say later. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's fascinating uh, to hear, um, well, not fascinating, it's great to hear all the tangible actions and, um, support that your organization provides your organizations. Um, uh, welcome, welcome Jodranko Gwazdanovic. Uh, thank you for joining us at the panel here. We've uh, just started the discussion. We've only heard from Mark Schiltz at the moment. Um, and right now we're going to pass on to Rick Vanderbilt to hear his comments specifically on uh, what your stakeholder organization's current gender equality priorities are for the new era. Uh, Rick, please. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you also to uh, Marcella, uh, to the Gender Action Team, and to the Slovenian Presidency, actually, for the invitation and for um, organizing um, this, this very important event. Um, the topics of equality, diversity, and, in, and inclusion are really high, on both on my personal agenda as Rector of Ghent University and as President of, um, of CESAR. And um, in my role as President of CESAR, I, uh, I have personally committed to contributing to the European research area and therefore also to the topic of today that is, that is, that is should be, that is an integral part of the, of the era. Um, there is a strong and, and consistent um, evidence that gender inequality uh, is, a, is a long standing challenge actually, uh, particularly at universities of science and technology. And as you know, CESAR is, a, is, is an alliance, is, a, is an association of universities of science and uh, technology. So for us as an organization, this is, this is a really important um, topic. And that is why we as an association, as CESAR, back in 2013, we re reaffirmed our commitments uh, and we have uh, carried out and published white papers and equality surveys uh, both in 2014 and 2018, including uh, data and, and sharing um, best practices. And, and we have also adopted a declaration on EDI, and this was in 2019 with, with really concrete um, pledges. And uh, this declaration is publicly available, of course, on our website, and we will publicly also report on the achievements uh, and this will, uh, these publications will be in, in 2024. Uh, now, to support our members in, in achieving uh, our pledges, our task force, human resources, and our network of EDI liaisons are, are organizing a, a wide range of activities and, and efforts. And importantly, and what I feel actually um, sometimes is somehow, somehow lost, in these discussions is the reason why we put such a strong focus on, on EDI, both at, at Ghent University and at CESAR. Um, there is a persistent misconception that EDI is something you do on, on the side of your uh, core activities as a bonus, so to speak, if you have additional time and resources. And of course, this is, this is not correct. It is incorrect. EDI uh, should be and is, uh, in my opinion, is an enabler. You need it. It's a foundation towards um, achieving the highest quality in, in all of our research, our education and um, innovation activities. And, and therefore, I am proud that our General Assembly, uh, General Assembly of CESAR, earlier this year adopted um, safeguarding equality, diversity and inclusion as one 
of our six strategic um, principles underpinning, underpinning all, our, all our activities. Now coming back, and I will conclude then, coming back um, to the starting points around current uh, gender equality priorities in, in relation to the new era, uh, I would like to finish with an, with an, with an invitation actually. While, um, while gender equality is indeed high on our agendas and, and rightfully so, uh, I invite all of us uh, actually to, to broaden our scope and, and whenever possible to the full spectrum of equality, diversity and um, inclusion. And, and this is a statement I wanted to, to start with. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you for those interesting comments. Uh, it's great to hear it so high up the agenda as well as the focus on um, evaluating and monitoring the work that you have already put out there for your organizations. I hear it closely links actually to Mark Schultz's uh, comments around Science Europe's discussion uh, about evaluating the research processes and their efficacy there. Um, so now I'd like to invite Paul Boyle uh, to interject a bit on behalf of the EOA, European Universities Association. Paul. Hi, and thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, obviously, we regard this EUA as a, a really crucially important topic and, and one that we're pleased is something that's being discussed again as part of the era uh, and as part of the research funding uh, mechanisms that are likely to be put in place in, in relation to Horizon Europe. So we are fully supportive of the focus on this area. I, I would follow up the, the point, though, that's just been made by our previous colleague uh, that at the EUA, of course, we, we view gender equality as absolutely vital and, and something we all ought to be working towards. But we also recognise the variety of different uh, EDI issues that also need attention, and, and some of which I think to date have perhaps not received the, the full attention that they deserve. So there is a broader message, but at the moment, let, let's focus our attention on the gender equality issues. Uh, EUA is a, an organisation that represents over 800 universities uh, scattered across 48 countries. So we represent a real variety of different types of institution, uh, which each institution, of course, sits within a different policy context, uh, the national policies as well as the European policies. Some of our members are part of the European Union and some are not. So we're quite a diverse set of organisations. And, and as a result, one of the things, of course, we do is collect information on a variety of differences across those institutions, including information on gender equality. Um, and although I won't dwell on it too long, uh, one of our most recent surveys of that conducted in 2019, 2020 does highlight the, the sorts of figures that we all know are important and we all know the, the, the broad situation that we are in. Um, for example, of course, 80% uh, of EUA members, uh, and this was based on a, on a survey that I think captured about 160 universities 80% uh, of those have gender policies in place, uh, but of course that does mean that one in five university does not. Uh, according to those data, uh, the proportion of female rectors has steadily increased between 2014 and 2021, so we have a sort of longitudinal element to the information we collect. It's increased by more than 70%, which, which is a, a fantastic achievement, I think, over that time. But of course it still is the case. Uh, that women uh, account for less than a fifth of all the EUA member university uh, rectors. So even though we've seen huge improvement, there's still obviously a long way to go. And indeed, we know from our data that there are 15 countries among the 48 that we represent that don't have any female rectors uh, among their members in those countries. So the data are quite stark. Uh, I could go on and on, and, and, and we all know most of the information around that. But there's two points I'd, I'd like to follow up on. One, I think it's really important when we are quoting these sorts of figures that we don't focus entirely on what's going on at the rector level, and we think much more about what's happening within institutions. So if I take the example of the policies that universities have, while we can collect information about institutional level policies, which are hugely important, and they do, of course, strike a, a, the sort of the, the strategic push from an organisation, it's also important, which we collect in our surveys to know whether or not deeper down in those organizations at academic discipline level or departmental or faculty level, whether those parts of the organization also have policies that are designed to help make change within the organization. And we see quite a lot more variability there. 
uh, while most universities do indeed have institutional level policies, much more variability in the way that those policies or, or different types of policies are being enacted lower down the organization. So this is one of the things that we're particularly pushing. The second thing is I think from a university point of view is to of course remember this isn't all about academia in a sense. It, our academics in most universities often are around about half of the staff and it's hugely important to make sure that we, we, we think about equality in relation to the work around teaching and, and research and everything they do. But of course, it's also about some of our administrative or managerial staff who support universities. And that, in a sense, for each institution is important for them to take on board those sorts of issues. And actually, across the membership, we find that there is uh, quite a good representation. In fact, uh, we, we find that uh, women are actually more likely to be in some of those managerial roles than men. So there's quite a number of issues, I think, that are going on within universities, uh, which, of course, universities must take hold of and, and must take very, very seriously, some of which, of course, overlap directly with Horizon Europe and directly with our research endeavour, some of which do not. I, I guess getting back to the point, it, it, it's about how we set a culture. And we also know, let's be honest, that among the countries and, and universities we represent, there's huge variability in success that we've seen over the last few decades. Uh, many people might point to Scandinavia as a part of Europe, which has had fantastic uh, results in this area and there are other parts of Europe where frankly things are not quite as well advanced and as an organization like EUA funnily enough I've literally just stepped out of our uh, strategic board meeting for EUA and one of the things we're discussing right now as I left the meeting was around how the organization can help shape the policies that its members adopts or not and, and whether we have expectations around memberships having to have policies related to certain issues and for us as a university body how we make sure those policies uh, are throughout the organization and are not just sitting at the top of the organization with the risk that sometimes those policies are, uh, are not necessarily well known and understood and, and, and abided by through the rest of the organization. So uh, I, I could talk for much longer, um, but that gives you a, a little bit of a, of a sense of where we're coming from as, as an organization, partly around collecting information, but also then thinking about how do we take that forward and, and actually try and make a difference in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I think that sets the um, it, it dives into this topic quite well, as after all this discussion is talking about, uh, well, we want to look at the future requirement of gender equality plans across all Horizon Europe uh, projects. And what does that mean to our stakeholders? So as you touched upon that, there's a variety of different um levels of progress and so our, where are the opportunities for mutual learning and where um, your organizations can step in to help with that mutual learning tapping into projects such as this the gender action conference that we're here with anyway i'll move on now uh Jadranka, great that you were able to join us um it would be great yes. to hear a few comments from you around your current gender equality priorities for the new era thank you thank you very much thank you very much for uh organizing this conference and inviting me. Uh, LERU, uh, the League of European Research Universities, unites 23 research intensive universities from uh, different European uh, member states and associated countries. Um, and LERU very much welcomes uh, the new initiative. Our colleagues uh, uh, tell us that this already means an upgrade in status of uh, gender equality uh, and also associated with intersectionality. Um, so uh, our colleagues tell us that already the universities are granting them fixed staff, which was not the case before. So there is already a positive effect of these uh, actions. Uh, many of our uh, in fact, most of our um, universities uh, uh, have uh, a highly developed requirement of gender equality on gender equality plans for research funding. And um, in fact, uh, they hope uh, that uh, these developed requirements um, will be sufficient in some way uh, that not too much administrative uh, burden uh, will be required. And um, so uh, I would propose that perhaps uh, a questionnaire would be needed to establish the level of development of gender equality plans uh, and also uh, a um, development perspective uh, in a timeline. Uh, and um, also, as the previous speaker said, 
it is very important to involve all the levels uh, of the structure uh, and particularly those uh, who are accountable for personnel because they can make plans and they know uh, how things can change. They know it uh, best and uh, this is our uh, strong advice. Uh, also, uh, it is important, of course, to involve the leadership, uh, but um, leaders uh, have to take care of so many areas and they really need expertise in the specific areas, including gender expertise. So this is uh, very important uh, to have gender experts working with leaders in institutions. Uh, it is also important um, to take into account the full career planning, uh, as I said, uh, at the individual um, units uh, accountable for personnel, but also generally, uh, because um, universities are still in a way uh, uh, lack the level of career planning uh, we know from industry, where you have the so-called matrix structure. Uh, with more uh, than one director uh, leading uh, activities. And uh, this is quite important to disentangle uh, the hierarchical relations, especially for early stage careers, um, who uh, in many instances fully depend on the one professor or uh, the one director uh, and uh, I think uh, this provides the basis uh, for many demonstrations of uh, hierarchy and authority, which are, can also be undesirable. In this sense, uh, there is work to do. Also, it is important to have training against bias, uh, but this training should be targeted, really targeted to the research uh, institutions. Uh, targeted for the tasks. Uh, and it is important to have biased observers, but they should also have a say, uh, not just observe. Uh, so, uh, I mean, um, we are on the right track, uh, but there is more needed for a successful implementation. So, Leiru very much uh, um, agree. Jajanka, uh, I think you've just by, uh, accidentally hit mute there as you were concluding. Are you okay? Okay. Thank you for your comments there. That, that was uh, really fascinating stuff. Especially, um, I liked the touching on the fact that you talked about uh, un unconscious bias. Uh, you weren't here for Mark Schiltz's um, uh, discussion on behalf of Science Europe, uh, but he actually touched upon that too. And so there's a good commonality there that perhaps we can go into a bit further. I also think um, the, your comment around uh, assessing the level of development and where we are now is quite interesting, especially in terms of the upcoming declaration that we will hear more of tomorrow, the draft Ljubljana declaration. There is uh, some interesting comments are in there around what must be done for uh, the support on a member state level. But thank you. I'm now going to invite, last but not least, uh, Oana van der Tocht to bring us a bit of a perspective, um, perhaps from outside of the uh, research university side and more around the intersectional side of things. I, I'd be grateful to hear your thoughts um, as to how ERTO has supported members such as yourself, NTP, and of course, what your organization does itself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chloe, for uh, uh, for having me here and for uh, for organizing this important discussion. Uh, my answer will be indeed twofold. Uh, originally, I've been asked if I can represent the EARTO uh, Association and its members. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a first response in the name of EARTO, uh, and then I'm going to take you towards we what we as TNO, uh, uh, one of the largest research organizations in the Netherlands, uh, are doing um, on the subject of diversity and inclusion. 
Um, so from uh, from the ERTO perspective, um, diversity and inclusion is is uh, is a very important subject. Actually, within the HR working group of ERTO, ten years ago, uh, uh, our colleagues uh, from the association have started working and paying attention to uh, uh, to DNI. Um, throughout the years, however, uh, due to the different nature of the organization of the members of EARTO, um, um, and also due to the cultural differences with which uh, the EARTO members are, uh, are having to deal with being placed in different countries, uh, EARTO has uh, decided to uh, take a role of facilitator for its members, um, but let the uh, intervention take place at the level of the organization itself. So from the ARTO perspective in the coming years, they will make sure that they will uh, organize workshop trainings so that the, the members, the ARTO members can communicate and can share experiences with each other. Uh, but the final responsibility will be left with, with us, with, uh, with the members. And now I'm going to take you to, to us, to TNO. Um, as an organization, we started working on diversity and inclusion and you hear me actually talking about diversity and inclusion and not just gender diversity because we are looking at a broader aspects uh, of diversity and we are actually not talking anymore about diversity but we are talking about inclusion in our organization so we started 10 years ago um, while for most of the organization uh, who are starting right now it goes from the top from the board members we started actually from the work floor some of our colleagues have signaled that we need to take some action and very fast uh, our board has set up a, a diversity and inclusion steering committee which was or uh, which consisted of members of the work floor engineers as well as members of different levels of the management organization we started by taking uh, by introducing interventions there where it's needed um, but very fast we went towards defining a di diversity strategy and in the last two strategic periods, actually, our organization has been guided by, by this diversity and inclusion strategy. Uh, what we are saying, and I heard actually Rick also mentioning, um, it's, it's not a matter of having the personnel, having the FTEs that are needed to, uh, to work on this subject. Uh, what we are saying is that it's also not a matter anymore of a business case. It's really just the right thing to do. So everybody who is working in our organization and starts working in our organization, we want them to feel at home, no matter of their origin, no matter of their gender, no matter of their sexual orientation, no matter of uh, disabilities and so on. Um, every employee of TNO to have uh, equal chances to employ themselves so that they can uh, reach their maximum, maximum potential because that's the only moment when we as organization can also reach our, our potential. Uh, so very concrete, and I know that uh, the question on, on the interventions will come further on as well, but very concrete. I recognize what, what the previous speakers have said. We've, we've done, we've, we've taken similar actions. So we've been looking at creating awareness in our organization, organizing bias trainings at different levels of the organization from the work floor to, uh, uh, to the board level. We uh, we gave uh, we organized uh, still we organized and we're still organizing leadership trainings to empower our female population. Uh, we are uh, we have been looking at our HR processes to ensure that bias gender bias is uh, is eliminated from uh, from the HR processes a uh, selection process of, of, of new employees. Uh, we, we have uh, monitored the numbers, so uh, very early on we started looking at the numbers at different levels of, of, on the organization, and we have monitored them throughout the years. And as I said, in the last two strategic periods, we have defined a DNI strategy, um, and right now we have actually, for, for our leadership, uh, we, we have defined KPAs, so, and we are not looking just at the numbers because the numbers are not saying the entire story, but we are looking also at the progression. So we have defined even KPAs on the progression from one year to the, uh, to the other one. Um, and I think there are a lot of, uh, well, there are a lot of other interventions we have, which we have done, but uh, um, uh, this is just, uh, just, uh, just a tip and um, we can talk later about the rest. Indeed, there's, there's lots to talk about, it's apparent. And um, thank you so much for that insight, both into ERTO and TNO. Apologies for calling it NTO earlier, that's my mistake, dyslexia. Um, 
Uh, just a quick comment on your in your input there. I think uh, it's apparent throughout all of the speakers here that you are looking broader than just the gender issue. Uh, whilst we're here under the gender action platform with this and with the science, uh, with the Slovenian presidency of the Council of EU looking at gender equality as a priority, uh, it's heartening to hear that um, diversity goes wider for your members, uh, broader than just uh, the focus on gender, gender dimension and gender parity there. Um, I think I can, I'm safe to say that it uh, sounds like a whole load of work, a whole host of work is underway already within your organizations, uh, especially in terms of readying your wider memberships. Um, I thought I would take the opportunity to allow yourselves to, rather than just me, provide comments to the discussion. If any of you would like to come back to interject to each other, I think uh, Mark Schultz, it would be great to hear a bit more. Um, you mentioned that there was more that you would like to interject on, uh, specifically perhaps around that wider diversity area, but please feel free to um, talk broader than that too. Yes, thank you, Chloe. I think the previous speakers have uh, eased that because they've taken up many of the uh, of the uh, items which uh, which uh, which I find useful and which I wanted to bring up as well. So, of course, yes. So, as far as Science Europe is concerned, we um, we have actually just published our new strategy plan for uh, for for the upcoming five years. And within that strategy, there is one of three major priorities is, is uh, to contribute to the evolution of what we now call research culture. And research culture embodies quite a number of, uh, of issues, but one of, one of the important issues is, is about uh, what we call IDE, so equality, diversity, and inclusion. And, uh, uh, and, and, um, and that's what will guide the activities of our... So it, it's beyond, I think, of course, gender is... is still i would say the, the most important uh, aspect that we have to consider but it goes beyond that um uh, also for uh, for ethnic min minorities uh, for instance and and, and and even i would say a less uh, well favored uh, research or less well favored uh, people that have a less well a less favored background how to um uh, how, how, how to provide a more inclusive environment for uh, at our universities, at our research centers and research organizations. Um, and I think there are very strong, uh, strong uh, activities or at the national level of, in a number of countries like the UK, uh, where the UKRI has, has, has also positioned this, uh, uh, this issue about research culture or this program on research culture as, uh, as uh, really at the center of their uh, of their of their strategy, there are very interesting developments in the uh, in the Netherlands and and in a number of, of other countries uh, countries as well. May I just jump quick quickly on on what what uh, what Paul Boyle said, which I fully subscribe. That yes, when when we're looking at the, at data, it's easy to 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 just look at at, at some indicators or parameters. And, and Paul mentioned the number of rectors, uh, women rectors appointed, which which is which has been a, a where, where they've seen a very favorable development, which is very good. But, but I, I agree, probably needs to go a little, need to go a little bit further down. There, there are tricky issues still. Um, we may we may achieve uh, gender balance by numbers, but uh, do we also achieve it by numbers in leadership positions? Uh, do we also uh, achieve it by if, if we look at statistics, uh, uh, a permanent position versus uh, versus uh, uh, time limited, uh, time limited employment positions. Uh, uh, so these are the more tricky issues, where or the, or the more detailed issues, where where we have to be careful, or where we have to carefully look, and whether even we, if we may have a gender balance overall, it, when you look at these more detailed uh, um, indicators, uh, it, it may still reveal things. I, I and I think we we were in 2017 when we were listing the. Uh, uh, in our recommendations, when we were listing the indicators that uh, research organizations should follow, we were hesitant at that time uh, to bring up uh, things like gender pay gap analysis. But I think that would, at that present, I think that's that's something which research organizations should also collect and and, and publish, of course, on an aggregate level. But nevertheless, uh, because we don't want, as I say, we don't want to find ourselves in a, in a situation where we can say we have achieved gender balance by numbers. Uh, but but not maybe not uh, when it comes to uh, to pay to to salaries maybe not when it comes to leadership positions and uh, and these things. Thank you. 
Um, I was just going to invite you in, uh, Rick, there, because I, I know that you touched on the fact that you view it as a cross-cutting issue and that you do uh, quite a lot of significant work around um, uh, data. So please do, and monitoring and evaluation, please do come in. Well, uh, I, I just wanted to, to highlight that in the intervention of the colleagues, uh, there was a topic that came back. Uh, at least Mark uh, explicitly mentioned it, and also Oana mentioned it, the, the importance of um, evaluating uh, research and the importance of evaluating um, people, researchers. Uh, and I think this is very, very important in the context of, uh, of, of achieving a better uh, gender balance. Um, um, I think we need to put more uh, attention to questions like how do we measure the quality of research? And what do we mean by evaluating people? Do we mean evaluating, ev evaluating individuals? Do we refer to evaluating teams or something in between? Do we evaluate people as a part of a, of a team? And these are really fundamental questions. And, and also uh, with respect to the, to the metrics uh, to use, uh, actually, at, at Ghent University, uh, two to three years ago, we, we drastically changed the way in which we are evaluating uh, our professors. And, and basically, we, we ran away from the purely uh, quantitative um, approach. And we, we do a much more uh, qualitative uh, approach uh, uh, now. Basically, we ask our professors um, uh, every two to three years, uh, what are you proud of? And of course, they can mention uh, publications. And of course, they, they can mention that they have they, 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 they guided a lot of uh, PhD students and they, they obtained a lot of money to do research. But they can also mention other things. Um, and basically, at our university, you can, you can become, you can have a promotion to the level of full professor from, from, from a senior lecturer, uh, senior lecturer level to you can jump basically to, to, to a full professorship without having to mention the number of publications that you have. And I know this is, this is, this is drastic, but, 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 but we did it. And I think it is very important to take into account the, the impact of career paths on, on uh, whether we are on, 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 on the issue of a, of a gender balance. That, that's one thing. And then very briefly, another thing, we should not think that uh, we as universities or we as, 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 uh, as, as research organizations or, 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 or the industry, um, we should not think that we can solve the problem by ourselves. Um, uh, like I have an engineering background in my, in my field of, of research and field of uh, education. One of the major problems is that the, uh, the students that are coming to the university, there is a huge uh, unbalance. If you look at the numbers there, only about 20% of our uh, engineering students are, are, are females. So this means that the problem starts before these students enter the university. We, we, we are not able to, to convince uh, young girls that uh, engineering, uh, science, technology is an important field for, for them as well, that, that these are fields that are attractive for, for them as well. So I think if we want to solve the problem in certain fields, we need to link with uh, secondary schools, even with, with, with primary um, schools. The problems, start, the problems start at a very, very young age, much younger than, 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 than 18 years or 20 years, typical, typical uh, ages of uh, university students. These are the points that I wanted to, to add to the discussion. Thank you, yes, useful as well. And I, I think the... Um... Uh, touching on the qualitative approach there uh, of assessing where we are, how 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 we evaluate our successes within and the challenges, of course, uh, with researchers, touches and links with um, uh, the speech that we heard earlier from Marcella Linkova, where she was talking about the different approaches, and also when you touch on synergies, the synergies with education. That again links quite well with the upcoming discussion on the draft uh, Ljubljana Declaration that will be discussed tomorrow, where I, I'm aware that synergies are touched upon there and emphasized as something that we must look at with, through the lens of gender equality, that it's only through pulling together across these different synergies that we can uh, progress further. I'm, do, would Paul or Wana or um, Gravan, uh, 
Jadranka like to come in or otherwise I might move our discussion to look forward looking. Is there anything you'd specifically like to comment upon here? Well, I can uh, let, let me uh, let me um, I, I I recognize what Rick is saying. Uh, it, it, the the problem starts uh, starts very early in schools, and um, and we have two options. Uh, basically, what we see our engineers, uh, female engineers, are offering uh, their their hours, their free time, uh, to go as role models to schools, and uh, in order to uh, to uh, to help you know, build the, the attraction towards technical fields. In the same time, um, what, uh, what we also see, um, um, because the pool of, of, uh, of personnel, of future personnel for the organization in the Netherlands is, um, is um, well, small, as, as, as mentioned in, uh, in Belgium, um, we are looking across the borders. Um, we are looking for the best quality um, uh, future engineers for our organization, um, and and uh, 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 with different with different backgrounds. So th those are uh, really two of the uh, of the actions which uh, which uh, we have taken to um, to ease um, to ease the situation on on the gender uh, the gender data gap. But there are a number of other uh, other actions. I, I think uh, I don't remember Rick or Mark also mentioned um, uh, when I think Rick you mentioned. Uh, are we looking at evaluating our people or also our research? And that's what we recognize as well. It's it's also a matter of paying attention. So that's why the gender gender bias trainings paying attention to uh, uh, to the evaluation of the personnel of the teams. Uh, to the career progression of of, uh, of the individuals, uh, without uh, without bringing our own biases, because we know our research shows that we have actually the tendency to select somebody or to promote somebody who actually mirrors uh, mirrors us in terms of behavior, maybe physical appearances and so on. So we want to make sure that in our progression, in the career progression of our employees. Uh, bias is um, is eliminated for as much as, as it's possible to eliminate something from uh, from our own DNA. Um, but um, there is um, it, it's possible. It, it, it progress can be made. Um, we see in our organization that, for example, in comparison to 2015, where we had 19% female representation uh, at the top, so the board level and the first director levels. Now we are at 44% just by uh, by applying different interventions. It's not there, and as Mark said, it's not only about the numbers. It's really, um, it's really also uh, about how inclusive we are. We are treating uh, the colleague next to us. It's really about, um, um, it's really about the. Well, Mark mentioned the pay gap. It's something also uh, on intervention which we have introduced in our organization last year. We have done a first assessment about the gender pay gap. Um, it's it's about more factors, and it's at the end of the day, it's actually about how inclusive an organization is towards uh, towards its employees. Thank you. And just okay. briefly, Paul, I, I, I Jadranka, we will come to you. But Paul had here he motioned that he'd like to come in quickly. Um, I do ask you to keep these short. Apologies, because I do want to move us on to uh, forward looking at Jet. But Paul, quickly, and then we'll come to you, Jadranka, in a in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I think it's obviously also important for us to think about uh, as a sector and, and, and how we define what the sector is, of course, is tricky for, for the body I'm speaking on behalf of its universities, but of course it also includes Mark's funding agencies and, and others, so there's a, a wide range of organisations involved. And I think we just have to really focus in on what are, what are the structural elements of our sector that are likely to hinder men, women, other groups in, in different ways. And, and we know that there's a number of those. And of course, in my in previous roles, I, I've run one of the research funding agencies, so I'm fully aware of some of those. But we, we are an unusual sector in the, in the level of casualization that we have, um, the number of people who are on short-term contracts. And we do know that there are impacts of those short-term contracts which have bigger impacts on women than they do on men. We also know that we're a sector where in the past, even though we're trying to move away from it, we've tended to fall back on uh, measuring quantity of, of publications and quantity of, of research grants in, in a way that perhaps isn't productive. And again, 
is going to have an impact on certain people more than others, whereas a focus more on quality. So I, I think it's thinking about those very structural elements within, uh, they're not easy to solve. I, I'm not suggesting we, we can easily overnight solve them. I think we all understand what the challenges are. And really, I think now as we move forward in the next years, we really have to try and get to grip with some of the, grips with some of those really important structural challenges. Thank you. Yes. Um, and I, I, I would like to come back to that when we move on to looking at the gender equality plans and what that means in terms of structure. But Jadranka, you would like to come in with a final comment here on this topic? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, just very briefly, uh, indeed, uh, concerning gender equality plans, uh, we have to consider entire careers. Uh, there is a tendency uh, to measure success uh, by the top uh, uh, level, and um, there is a reason to say so, but in fact, in order to uh, have sustainable improvement, we need improvement along the entire line, and this uh, involves many factors. Uh, Leero published uh, a paper on bias in 2018 um, mentioning uh, the multiple factors uh, which may negatively affect uh, uh, women and uh, minorities. Um, and uh, also uh, bias is one important factor, uh, but then also uh, structural loopholes, so to say. So we really have to revise the structures uh, to see uh, where biases uh, can persist uh, due to the organization, and then we should act there. So there are indeed these two levels uh, that should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think that, that echoes quite nicely what Paul Boyle mentioned earlier around uh, looking at the deeper levels, not just at the, at the higher levels, but we should also be considering what is the impact and what is the status um, lower down into the, into the nitty gritty of the organizations. Um, but anyway, I'd like to uh, now move us on perhaps um, whilst we've reflected on the current situation and it's been great to hear about uh, all of the support and um, uh, the, the support and the status of the work of your organizations and your membership. I'd be interested to hear your views on the opportunities and challenges related to the new gender equality plan requirement in Horizon Europe. This is all quite closely interlinked to the discussion that we've just had here because this will be a tool to uh, embed some of the action that you've discussed. And so I'd, I'd welcome you to hear about uh, your thoughts on this. Um, Mark, could I invite you to start the conversation again? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So I think it's uh, what 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 um, uh, what what Paul uh, just just mentioned is is very important that we should take this as an opportunity also to look at the broader structural uh, uh, structural elements which uh, which which may cause uh, uh, which may cause gender uh, gender inequality in our in the research system as a whole, uh, and maybe the gender equality plans could be uh, could be the opportunity also for us to collectively reflect on that. Uh, because uh, there, there are hidden biases, if I may call if, if I may call them like that, which, uh, uh, for, for instance, related to how we, so Rick said it, how we assess uh, researchers where a lot is being done, uh, where many of us, including also funders and many universities, move away from lists of publications and lists of students that have been mentored and lists of this and that. Uh, for instance, uh, we uh, a number of age funding agencies uh, in our association now uh, uh, experiment with narrative CVs, uh, where you have to describe your key uh, your, your key achievements, and, and not in not in terms of numbers, but in terms of uh, descriptions. So these are important uh, uh, in, in important developments, I think. Uh, so the reassessment of the uh, of the reward and incentive system. What is it that we uh, what, what is it that we value in research? But still, I think we, it's, it's, it's going to be a very long road to, uh, uh, to, to move forward. Um, because when it comes to careers, researchers' careers, I think there are many hidden uh, biases here as well. Friends who are very bad in dealing with career breaks. The research system isn't designed in a way that uh, uh, what, what is expected is, is, a, is, a, is a linear career, steady progress. Uh, so career breaks are an issue. Uh, 
we, of course, I'm not saying that there are initiatives here as well. Uh, the, the Swiss Science Foundation, for instance, for many years, they have a special grant for uh, for people, men and women, actually, uh, that 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 uh, that went out of research for uh, for a certain time uh, uh, to to come back to reintegrate. But but still, I think the expectations in many places in the re in the research system as a whole is still linear career uh, career breaks. Mm, it's not so well seen uh, or part time. Uh, if you take some time uh, off to to care for for from family, for instance, it's also not so. We're also not very good at mobility. People that come from other sectors into the academic sector is uh, is not something which uh, uh, which is so widespread and so openly uh, practiced. So I think we need to reflect on uh, on on these structural elements. Which uh, and unfortunately, we have seen during the COVID nineteen crisis that. Uh, uh, that these um, that these structural features uh, they they have disadvantaged uh, women disproportionately uh, because after all when these lockdown there has been a study in the US and in a number of other countries uh, a survey uh, which has clearly evidenced that uh, that the greater share of responsibility for for children and family during lockdowns and when schools were closed was was falling on the on, on, on women and then that women researchers have disproportionately uh, been much more disadvantaged in their career uh, in their in their advancement through the uh, 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 during the COVID crisis and I think this unfortunately reveals something so that's the challenge for the future. Thank you yes and it will be interesting to see how um the uh, I think it's it's closely linked to the short term contract contracts how we've referenced before where you've discussed uh, that there's the non linear career path there's the career breaks and how does that interplay with these short term contracts and some of the nature the nature of research um, and so how will gender equality plans perhaps impact that when uh, when people are bidding for Horizon Europe funding. Um, Rick, could I invite you to uh, now come in on behalf of your organization? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, of course, so far we have been discussing a, a, a lot of activities and efforts uh, already going on uh, uh, in our associations, uh, surveys, white papers, declarations, workshops, things like that. And, and of course, they are very, very, very important. But uh, in this part, um, I would like to highlight also the importance of leadership. Uh, the importance of leadership both inside and outside uh, universities or our organizations to, to advance um, um, equality, diversity, and um, inclusion. Um, inside universities, we, uh, we definitely must address and live the values uh, as, as, as foundational uh, for promoting, promoting EDI. And, and these values include uh, safeguarding uh, research integrity, um, um, things like um, academic freedom, uh, institutional autonomy, and, and these are laid down actually in, in what is called the Magna Carta Universitatum. Uh, and in the light of the changing context uh, in which universities today operate, um, think of, think of uh, despotism and, and, and even um, authoritarianism, uh, by the way, also, and unfortunately also within, within the European Union, uh, this, uh, these values are not to be taken for granted. It's, it's not a trivial thing that will be there forever. Um, and for example, we from Ghent University, we just signed the new uh, 2020 uh, version of the Magna Carta. And I, I really encourage um, all universities and Cesar as an organization really encourages all universities which have not done so uh, to do so. Uh, essentially, uh, this, this set of values lays the foundations for university leadership to come into action and, and the defense of these uh, very values by other societal players uh, is essential as well for universities to assume their role in, uh, in society. Uh, and the point really is uh, that we must address and we must live these values, especially in light of troubling uh, developments with, uh, with EDI coming, coming, coming under attack once again, also within, within the EU. And to do this, um, in my opinion, sustainable support and leadership also outside uh, universities is needed. Uh, for example, the, the uh, uh, effectively support, uh, the, to, to effectively support uh, EDI um, universities depend on a range of 
professional staff and they must be able to, to flexibly offer uh, diverse and long-term career options uh, to its talent in this area. And take the example of science management, for, uh, uh, which, which includes professional support to design and to support the uh, implementation of gender equality plans. Uh, and too often today, universities do not have the sustainable funding needed for um, long-term support of talent in this area, but are instead um, often forced to, to couple together, so to speak, this support in, in ad hoc um, ways. And we were therefore very pleased that, uh, that gender and diversity was mentioned explicitly in the Vision 2030 report as part of the, of the transformation modules. Uh, and, and, and there is a willingness from the commission to support um, ERA stakeholders with this. Now, to maybe to summarize, um, in addition to ongoing um, activities around um, developing and sharing best practice, practices, which is, of course, once again, very important, leadership in university must address and live uh, values with the, with the Magna Carta uh, as a key, as a key um, reference point. Leadership outside the university is needed as well to support these, these values and to provide um, the conditions and sustainable funding levels that we need to, to ensure um, long-term support for talent in, in, in all aspects of what, what universities do, including supporting and, and advancing um, EDI. These are the things that I, I, that I wanted to say. Uh, Thank you. Yes, it's, it's good to hear both the opportunity there um, around leadership and also to have some insight around the challenges um, related to uh, perhaps a competence gap um, to be able to design and develop the gender equality plans and that there is perhaps some more work and opportunity there to support our memberships and organisations. Um, Paul, I'd like to invite you in now to provide a few comments if you would. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I mean, I, I think sort of one of the fundamental points for, from a university perspective is, is really to try and recognise that diversity is, um, in, a, in a sense, a precondition for excellence. Um, diversity in our teaching, diversity in our approach to our research, in a sense, diversity is essential to providing an excellent university environment, rather than just seeing diversity as a, a sort of challenge to solve, you know, it, we, we must sort of meet certain targets and so on. Of course, that's important, but it's crucial to what we do. And therefore, it's really important that we get to grips with this and, and, and solve it because it'll drive excellence in, in everything that we do in our institutions. So thinking about that as a sort of a slightly more philosophical point, I think it's helpful because it, it encourages us to drive change more than perhaps sometimes change is driven simply by, uh, by trying to address it simply as a set of targets. I mean, having said that, I think the idea of gender equality plans is a good one. And I, and I think um, Horizon Europe will be, you know, it, it will help encourage people to think about these issues more than they have done before and so on. So I do, I do support the general approach. But I would also like to add that in a way, um, we need to think about the different levels. You know, you, you can say, first of all, have universities got a plan? That's, that's a good sign. Uh, secondly, does the plan cover enough different criteria and, and issues around the broad area of gender equality? And that's the second sort of level of measurement. But the third level, I think, which is really vital is, is what change has been experienced and what has been actually delivered. So in, in, I think people may be aware in the UK, of course, we have the Athena Swan approach to measuring our, our gender equality status. And some funding agencies have made it clear that if we don't meet a certain status within Athena Swan, we will not be eligible for funding. That's really changed the approach to things in, in, in UK universities. And it's because the Athena Swan does not just expect to say we are going to work in these areas, it, it wants demonstrable evidence of, of change that's occurred. It wants dem demonstrable evidence of, of policies that have led to that change and also what the plans are for the future. So it's that third level in the end that I think we have to strive for if we're going to really see considerable differences as we move forward. The final thing I would say is um, I think there's been a lot of focus, perhaps sometimes coming out of the open access um, debate, actually, around how we assess researcher careers, uh, because, of course, the, the slight challenge that as we move towards open access, we we may be in a position where some early career academics are not being encouraged to publish in some of the journals they might have done in the past and so on. 
I, I think from EUA's point of view, while we would absolutely support the, the emphasis that has to be put on that, I, I think our view would be that we have to think about the career in, in, the, in the whole. And for most of our academic colleagues, not all, but for most of them, research is one part of the story. But there's a whole set of other things they do, including teaching, but also including administration and various other things that we must not ignore. And we must not ignore particularly from a gender perspective, because of course, men and women are, are differentiate across those different parts of the, of the university experience. So having a much broader holistic understanding of what a career is about and what the various things are that we contribute to that career. And as we pointed out earlier, perhaps moving a little bit more towards understanding quality measures rather than quantity and, and some of those elements are things that I think we can think about as we go forward. So back to my original point, I suppose, uh, that I'm fully supportive of having these sorts of plans. I think it's a really good step in the right direction, but it is about how do we actually take those sorts of things and, and actually prove and deliver on change rather than thinking that once we've got those in place, the, the job is done. Indeed, and I, I know um, a priority under the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the EU uh, within research and innovation is uh, to look at the governance structure of ERA. So there's that's some quite useful input for us to think about uh, as we further develop the governance and establish the new era, because of course evaluation and monitoring is key to it, and there's a lot of mutual learning opportunities as well. Uh, it appears that we've just lost uh, Jadranka, so I will now move on to Oana, if that's all right, if I could um, bring you into the conversation. Thank you. And hopefully Jadranka will be able to join us again. Thanks. Yeah, so, well, let's start with the last thing you mentioned, though. It's uh, um, about uh, an event like this uh, or uh, the European Union offering opportunities of uh, sharing experiences um, between different organizations. It's it's um, really amazing to hear uh, what what uh, my colleague panelists are confronted with or are observing in, in this field in their own organizations. While we are a different type of organization, we have similar observations as well. So if it will be for me to um, to say that the, one of the first gains we can very fast uh, have each one uh, each organization is just by by bringing us together in the in a European context and sharing uh, our experiences and interventions to learn from each other and I think that's that's also what uh, what was made um, uh, uh, made clear by the previous speakers um, in order to uh, to be successful in DNI uh, you need you need to have budget and you need to have the expertise in-house in order to to be able to take the proper actions because again it's not about the numbers but it's about the bigger picture which uh, which Paul mentioned with respect to the gender equality plan um, I think it's um, well it's it's an amazing initiative it's one of the first steps uh, uh, but we as organizations, we need to go beyond that. For us, the gender equality plan uh, comes really at the right moment. Um, uh, we are already working on it and we are going to have it ready in September. But that comes because we have 10 years of experience and of a lot of effort we've put in this subject. I can understand, I can imagine that for other organizations, this might be very challenging um, because it's not easy to uh, uh, assess uh, uh, the, your, your uh, procedures um, and, and the progress uh, throughout the years if you haven't started uh, already some time ago. Um, and, but uh, as I said, um, well, for us, it's um, it's something that's part of our uh, daily work uh, activities. Um, but that being said, we also recognize that we are not there, like all the previous speakers have indicated. You know, we what, what we need to do is actually get to. Uh, uh, to a point where DNI is part of our DNA, and we do not need to uh, to have awareness uh, trainings or bias trainings. We do not need to talk about uh, uh, why it is important, but but we need to uh, show an emotional intelligence level which allows us to understand that. For example, COVID, as Mark said, has impacted uh, the female representation in the research institutes, in the universities. Um, and then we need to find a way uh, for that this impact to be uh, minimal. Uh, and it starts at home, in all fairness. 
um, uh, but we as organizations can also put in place some interventions uh, that 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 can help the female population. But again, it's I think it's really it's really about making sure that you know the the female population of Europe um, actually uh, has an equal start uh, with the male population, um, and that means that DNA should be in in the DNA of each individual working in an organization. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've um, linked together quite well the uh, the previous speaker's comments and emphasised the nature of the cross-cutting issue that it is. And of course, the mutual learning opportunities and challenges that we have ahead of us. Um, I, I have received a couple of questions from the floor. However, I'd like to first invite you all if you have any comments for each other before I um, bring these to your attention. Would anyone like to respond to anyone else? I know that, uh, Oana, you've just mentioned the work that Mark has uh, highlighted earlier. Um, Mark, do you have any comments on that? No problem if not. Well, yeah, I think it's, what to, to continue on that, I think we, we really need to put it in the broader perspective of um, uh, of, of researchers' careers and, uh, and 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 the variety and diversity of careers that we uh, that we that we actually do embrace in the uh, or wish to embrace in the future in the uh, in the research in the in the research uh, in the research sector. As I said, I would certainly welcome. Uh, well, I think it would certainly be useful or or, or even um, uh, important for research organizations to to. To be to be somewhat more open when it comes to, and and also to mobility. I, I mean, we're in in Europe. We're quite closed in our academic uh, systems. Uh, there is mobility. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that uh, that people from other sectors cannot uh, enter uh, or re-enter uh, the the academic sector. But but it remains relatively rare. We we, we still stick to the somewhat monolithic idea of what uh, a great research career. Uh, should be, and I think I can fully embrace uh, what Paul said. It's uh, we shouldn't uh, this diversity issue. Uh, we shouldn't regard it as a problem to solve, but we should really seize it as an opportunity and a precondition uh, to uh, to create excellence in our system. I fully applaud that. Thank you. Any further comments? Otherwise, I will start bringing in the uh, questions from the floor. Fantastic, right. Um, and of course, do feel free to interject whenever. Um, so uh, we've got an interesting one here. Um, and, and of course, a reminder to all participants, please do send in your questions. Uh, we've got about uh, just under 10 minutes to be able to ask these panelists um, their views on any thoughts that may be coming through. So do share. Uh, so the first question I'd like to bring to you is uh, one that talks about um, intersectional inequalities, including racism, racial bias, and LGBTQI plus discrimination. And there are many good, there are, the question is around, are there any good practice examples in your member organizations already tackling these issues, as it often seems to be a challenge in implementing the gender equality plans? I would invite Rick first to come in on this. I had to unmute my uh, my microphone. Well, there are, there are of course uh, a lot of uh, uh, member members uh, of Cesar who are really focusing on uh, on the things that you you just mentioned. But um, let me be very honest. Uh, I also believe, and I think we we uh, we should dare to state this uh, explicitly. We are struggling with that. Uh, if I, if I look, for example, at, at, at my university, what I see here is that um, we, we put a lot of effort in, in, in LGBTQI uh, issues, uh, decolonization um, issues, um, um, in all types of inclusion. But what we see is that the driving motor for that exercise is actually the students. So I think to solve these problems, we need to have young people on board. I mean, they live racism. They know what it is. 
Uh, um, and um, for example, just yesterday, I had a meeting with, a, with, 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 with 20 students who were really asking uh, to do more than what we do already. Uh, and I think in order to find out um, what, what, what the problems are for our students in terms of racism and, 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 and things like that, we have to, to come to policies together with them. Uh, we should not think that we as rectors or we as university professors, we know everything uh, and we devise a plan and then we say, okay, look, this is, this is, this is the plan. These are the actions. That, that is explicitly what they stated uh, yesterday. They said, look, yes, you, you, you put a lot of time and energy uh, in this domain, but we don't see the results. And what you do might be important from your, from your point of view, but it's not enough from our point of view. And please talk to us, tell us what the problems are. We, we can tell you what the problems are. We don't have the solutions, but together we might, we might come to a, to a solution. So, so for me, um, inclusion in terms of including people when we, when we define our policy plans is a very important um, uh, factor actually uh, in order to be able to, to, to do better than, we, than what we do until now. So yes, mm -hmm. there are good practices. Yes, there is a lot of work that, that has already been done, but we need more. We, we definitely need more. Interesting. I think that actually quite well links to another question that's come through from the floor, um, which is about asking around good examples for where universities and research institutes have uh, linkages to schools because often they hear that universities say that there's a lack of pipeline, there's a lack of linkage. I think this comes in relation to the career pipeline that we've uh, previously discussed um, about getting women into STEM engineering, for example. Uh, but I think that is also similarly linked to how do you bring the voice of the youth, as you've just mentioned, Rick, into the development of uh, th these practices within within also gender equality plans. I wonder if Paul, you have any comments on uh, good examples of university and research institutes linkage to schools or indeed LGBTQI plus, et cetera, uh, racism, race, I shouldn't say et cetera. There's so many important diversity, wider EDI uh, mm -hmm. diversity issues. Thank you. Yeah, I think on the wider question, I mean, we, we're all going to say, I'm sure that we, we recognize there's serious issues here, but we've got a very long way to go. Uh, if we reflect back on the gender issue, uh, we're in a situation where, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, we would expect half of our various different parts of the organisation to be men and half to be women. And we've been working on this for decades and we are still some way off for a variety of reasons. And, and there's a, a whole set of reasons for that. We have far more challenges in many ways in some other areas. So if we go back to the example of gender inequality, uh, if you go back decades, of course, men dominated university settings entirely. Uh, the student body was dominated by men. The, 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 the lecturing and the professorial body was dominated by men. And now we see a situation where in most universities, women are outnumber men, at least in the student body. We're seeing increasing proportions of women in the, uh, the post-PhD and postdoctoral areas. And so we're gradually seeing that change come through, but it's taken a long, long time to get there. It really has meant really fundamental changes. And if I think, for example, around the issue that we're struggling with in our institution, I know many are, and it's a particular issue at the moment around race and, and how we accommodate that. Um, I, I've been doing some reverse mentoring with, with one of our black students to try and understand what it's been like for, for that student to experience being at university. And of course, what they prefer and what she would really like to see are uh, more people from her background who are teaching and, and explaining how things have been, uh, how, how things happen from a background that she can relate to more strongly. But of course, we don't at the moment, sadly, have the pipeline coming through in the way that we do have a pipeline of women coming through educationally at the different stages. We don't have that same pipeline, at least in the UK, in the numbers of staff we would expect to come through at different levels of the system. So there's a huge amount of work to, to deliver that change, even though we all absolutely understand how vital that change is. So um, I'm not going to pretend that we have solutions, obviously, uh, to solve it immediately. But I do think that with persistence, we can get there. And there are a number of steps, of course, we can take. I, I think in, going back to your point about schools, um, well, certainly my university, and I think many, many universities 
work proactively with schools all the time. I mean, we, we, we do an awful lot of interaction with our local schools and our, what in the UK we'd call our FE colleges, um, those sort of post-16 to 18 colleges where um, uh, prior to, to, to coming to university. And, and we do a lot of things there which are all about widening access more generally. I mean, interestingly in the UK, I'm not sure if it's the, the case across the whole of Europe, but uh, in the UK, one of the tricky issues we actually have is representation from white working class boys is actually one of the worst problems we're facing. In encouraging uh, white working class men to engage with the system is, is actually more challenging than in some of the other ethnic groups. So we, we have a whole series of initiatives that we're trying to implement in schools to try and break down the barriers, including, of course, the one you mentioned earlier around women in STEM. So, so there's all sorts of different parts of this story that we have to try and, uh, try and iron out. Um, okay. As I said, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I don't think we will solve these problems overnight, but I do think there's a lot of action and, and a, a lot of work going into trying to think about how those relationships can help change things. I think Mark made the point earlier on that we we have to start, or, or, or I'm not sure it was Mark, but we have to start at the school level for some of this yeah. because if we don't, then some of those uh, views are, are, are inbuilt as people come through the, through the system. And I think you actually quite nicely summarise, I, I know you were talking directly about schools there, but saying that there are good examples out there, that there is opportunity um, for mutual learning, um, not just from my perspective, not just from that school interlinkage, but across the work that your organisations are doing with your memberships, um, looking at how do we embed good EDI. I'm really aware of the time. There are many more questions that have come through, but I'm unfortunately, I'm going to have to draw this session to a close because we are due to finish within a minute. I do apologise to Anna um, and Mark that we didn't bring you back in onto this discussion. It's been a fantastic panel. I'm, I'm very grateful for your uh, educated inputs and sharing um, your valuable insights. Thank you so much for your time. At this point in time, I'd like to uh, bring the session to a close. Oh, Dedrenka, you're here just in time for me to say thank you for your input. Um, we are unfortunately having to bring uh, the whole session to a close and actually this first day, we're now uh, concluding the first day. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esmol. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.